Cool. Does this work? No. Sorry. OK, that works. Cool. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. This is one of the last talks at the conference, and everyone's feeling really exhausted. Um, it's a real pleasure to present at the very end, apart from all the kind of nervousness leading up, because I benefited from learning so much through this whole conference. This is my first LCA, so thank you all so much for all your contribution. That's been really fantastic. Um, I'd really love to start off today by paying my acknowledgments to the traditional custodians of this land, the um, Muhanina people, who are the traditional custodians of this bit of Tasmania. I think whenever we're talking about power, which is what I think free software is about and what democracy is about, that we acknowledge the power structures that, that we exist in and have come before us, and particularly in um, Tasmania, but all over Australia, uh, the traditional custodians were um, forced not to speak their language and had their, had their lands taken away, and um, many of them were murdered. So I think it's important to acknowledge that. Um, I'm from the Open Australia Foundation. The Open Australia Foundation is a tiny little Australian charity that has a long history with LCA. I think it was eight or nine years ago, um, last time you were here in Tasmania, that Matthew Landau met Hanari Deegan, um, who's here as well today. And that's part of the reason all of our projects exist. So we wouldn't, we wouldn't exist in the form that we do without LCA. And we're all about hacking democracy. Um, and what does that mean is what I'm going to kind of get to today. Um, how, how do we think about hacking democracy? How do we think, our pro how do we think about our projects? Uh, I want to look at one project in, um, in particular and where I think that's going, because I think there's lots of lessons there for how we can use our skills in free and open source software to actually change this democracy that we're living in or, or your other democracies and communities around the world. Um, and here is us. This is kind of what we do. I, I, I'm always fascinated in the makeup of teams. So, um, oh, it's going crazy. Um, but there's two of us full time, and that's me and Hanari. And then we have a great family of contributors and volunteers who help make all our projects possible, and it absolutely wouldn't be possible without them. Um, Matthew Landau and Kat Samanska are also in this picture, who are the two founders of the Open Australia Foundation. And this is us in uh, April. We were redesigning what those really crap development application notices look like, um, which we thought would be nice to have a, a big tree, and like, should this tree be cut down or not, or things like that. Anyway, that's us. Well, maybe we can fix this stutter. I can keep going while we do it, but it would be good to fix that. OK. I think it is kind of cool. People pay a lot of money for these effects, actually. Um, but let's keep going. So democracy is a hack. What do we mean by that? So when we talk, we talk about democracy a lot at this conference and other conferences. And it's kind of just used as this term, like everybody understands what that means. But I actually think it's quite important that we interrogate that and think about what we're really um, supporting there or, um, or what, what the important bits of democracy are that we actually want to support. So people, um, when, when we think of democracy, common things that come to mind are the idea of free and open elections and the ability to elect a government or kick a government out if you don't like them. Um, human rights and like a base standard in equality, a rule of law that is equally applied, um, and uh, civic participation, so opportunities to get involved with um, decision making in our civic life, in our community. But really democracy is about power and our, our power to, to make decisions about, there we go, to make decisions about what happens in our society and to us and to other people. Um, and I think democracy is about decentralized power, okay, which is quite similar to ideas about free and open source software. Um, and all those institutions and human rights and free and open elections, those are all devices to try and decentralize power. But they're not the goal in themselves. Those, those are really, really important things. Uh, and we can support them in different ways. And they're all kind of interesting. But we need to kind of stay focused on what we're actually aiming for here. Uh, and that's that people can affect the change they want. And that's really what the Open Australia Foundation is about, helping people in quite practical ways do the things that they want to do and make the change that they want to make. It's about people's actual experiences and experiences of power um, and, and involvement in decision making and making decision, decisions and changing their society. So we have a bunch of little projects that are um, quite specific hacks. So each of these is a little focused experiment to change one aspect of how, we, uh, how a democracy works. So for example, they vote for you um, 
is about fixing a little bug in our democracy in Australia that it is, in fact, extremely difficult to find out how your federal MPs vote in Parliament, okay? which is a really, really important thing uh, for free and open elections and also being able to exert power over the people who represent us. So they vote for you, helps you with that. Um, but today I'm going to be talking about right to know mostly. So this conference is about the future. What is the future? Where is this place we are going? But I, I think, um, you know, and what's really come out through the conference as well, that we're talking about our future or different futures. Um, you know, the future is not evenly distributed, is an idea, but also there are different futures. So things might be getting more democratic in, in one place, power might be getting more decentralized, and it might be getting more centralized in another place, and people are being disempowered. Um, and there are all these different realities, and these futures are people's experience. They're happening at different times in different places, and changes that we can make to them um, all are about people's, um, their practical experience that they're living through. We had a really great time this year learning a little bit more about the future at an art space called Front Yard in Sydney. Has anyone ever been to Front Yard in Marrickville? Hanari has. Well, <laughs> it's a really, really fantastic place that's a um, just free open community space all about futuring practice. Um, Futuring is really interesting because it's about using some constraints to say, um, you know, we might have a future where resources are abundant or scarce or and people see themselves as participants or um, consumers. And then what might the future in a, around a specific thing like education or uh, open source software or whatever be like in those different, um, amongst those different constraints? And it forces you to really kind of document and write down what will people's experience be in that future. And then the idea is to say, well, those futures over there, they look, that sounds pretty good. This one sounds somewhat horrifying. So let's kind of get our way over to there. And so futuring by documenting all these little experiences really um, gives you agency and makes it about the choices you make um, to push us towards the futures that we want and away from the futures that we don't want. And here's, uh, this is an exhibition where we actually wrote down all these uh, futures on cards, and we made a, uh, the, um, the two spectrums of scarcity and uh, abundance were kind of spelled out in this room, and you could go around and pull down all these futures and look at them, and it was a really, really um, cool night. And that's Claire, the founder of Front Yard. And I don't think it's just about futures, but today I want to talk about near futures. Um, I'm not that interested in our like cyborg overlords of of the future, I'm interested in the next 10 years. That, that's really what's relevant to me and, and the projects that we're working on. But I also think um, we're talking about democracy. The next 10 years is very, very important. And does anyone here think there are probably some major bugs in our democracy that we need to fix quite quickly? Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, we're a nonpartisan charity, but you might say that. I couldn't possibly comment. Um, not just that, but also climate change is an you know, extremely important issue. Uh, we need to make much, much better decisions, I think, in the next 10 years, you know, fairly objectively. Um, and I, I don't know if our democratic institutions are currently up to scratch, or at least they seem to be failing. So I think we need some fairly massive change fairly quickly. Um, but change is also quite slow. Uh, does anyone recognize this person? This MIA? Does anyone remember the Carla album came out in 2007? Yeah, yeah, all right. Um, I always find it's like we're thinking about the future, let's think about the past and help that kind of uh, guide us to, to um, understand how things are going to change. So this came out in 2007. I know this quite well, but lots of you probably don't. Did anyone know Radiohead in Rainbows? Yeah, lots of people are into that. Um, that came out in 2007, so thinking about all the changes happened in your life since that came out, and all the changes in the way that you participate civically, you know, things have changed a bit, but they actually don't, haven't changed that much as well. So I, I think the change that we need is going to be more rapid than that change. So just to kind of cover what we've talked about quickly, unfortunately you can't read this, but um, I think we might need to power cycle this or something. But in other words, um, democracy is about decentralized power, and it's about people's experience. This isn't a slogan. This is about like, people living today and the actions and thoughts that they have and their agency. That's what we're talking about. Um, 
the civic hacking we're doing is about really targeted experiments. We're, as you know, a tiny team, and we need to do like really simple projects that do one thing really well, um, and, and we kind of hope that making that little adjustment will result in this bigger change over time. Um, we're talking about a future. The future is different everywhere. We're talking about different futures. And change is quite slow in this space, but we actually need quite a lot of change, and we need it to happen quite quickly. And that is a really big problem, and I, I don't know, you know how we're quite going to solve that, but I think that's reality, and there's no point hiding from it. Um, so this talk is going to be about how I think we get to that change and how our projects are trying to do that. Um, is this acceptable with this jittering? Is it readable? OK, cool. OK, we'll push on them. Um, so yeah, so this is going to be about how we actually get to that change and specifically looking at one of our projects and how I think that project is going to have to respond over the next five, 10 years, um, and us as developers and maintainers and potentially contributors, and there are lots of contributors here to our projects, um, the kind of work I think we'll be doing. But let's go back another 10 years almost to 1999. Uh, is anyone familiar with this book, um, Code? Yeah, a few people. Um, and on the right here, we've got Lawrence Lessig and Aaron Schwartz. People are probably very familiar with them. So this was, um, so that's 2002, um, when they were, that's the launch party of Creative Commons, actually. Um, but a few years before that, in 1999, Lawrence Lessig came out with this book uh, about the future of the internet. Uh, and he's a constitutional lawyer, so it's, you know, it's got this view about how we kind of adjust and tinker things to kind of create the change that we want. And at the time, he thought the internet, the communities, people on the internet and working in kind of cyberspace, as people were talking about it then, um, that they kind of were like, the internet's crazy and it's the Wild West and you can't regulate us and any kind of censorship or change you try and impose on us, we're just going to route around that and, you know, good luck. And this book is about, well, he kind of thought, actually, this is going to be regulated and the forces of you know, big money and corporations and governments who really have a will to regulate are going to change the architecture of the internet, particularly at the application layer, to increase surveillance and, uh, and censorship um, to reduce people's freedom, basically, and make them more reg regulable. And so this is almost 20 years later. We're 20 years and two years, and I think we've actually lived through a lot of that. Um, he really points to free and open source software as a pushback on that, and that if we could um, make more of that critical infrastructure free and open source, that would be a kind of barrier against some of that regulation. Um, I actually think that's, that's probably still true and a really interesting idea to, to talk about. Um, but anyway, this is this book. And it is really this futuring. He's kind of saying, well, like, here's this future I think we're going towards, and I think we should go towards this other future. And he talks about kind of tools to get there. And he sets up this framework for about regulation and how things change and the regulation that we operate inside. And he talks about um, rules, norms, prices, and architecture. And I'm going to use that framework. I've been thinking about it a lot over the last year um, to talk about our projects and because I think it, it is a, quite a good framework that gives us a lot of agency and suits us quite well as kind of hackers as well. So let's kind of just introduce ourselves to that. Imagine this garden. This is actually the beautiful garden at, at Front Yard. It's quite delicious. Uh, let's imagine someone who wants to get at these tasty greens, and we can be those that person, OK? So we would like to get some of these tasty greens. And what are the different forces that, that, impose, that, um, that are regulating us and that might prevent us or support us in getting at those tasty greens? So firstly, rules. Um, people who are trying to regulate this space might impose trespass rules, for example. Laws. And they might have you know, police or some way to enforce those rules on us, um, probably by threat of, of harm. Um, so that's one thing that can stop us from getting at those greens. Norms. So you might have friends or be part of a community that really looks down on people who go and steal other people's vegetables. Um, if, if we went and did that and violated those norms, they might impose some costs on us, like uh, excluding us from their friendship or something like that. 
uh, prices. So if, if the people who, who um, controlled this land decided that it actually cost $100 if you want to take any of these greens, that would be a way to exclude anyone who didn't have $100 from accessing these greens. And that could be us. So if we didn't have $100, we couldn't get those greens now. And architecture. So they could do all of those complex things, or they could just build a fence around the greens. Okay? And it's that last one that I think is particularly interesting um, for us. And uh, when we're talking about governments and democracy, is less thought about. And this isn't just about restricting people. Um, these rules can be put in place to encourage people. So you could have rules that said, hey, anyone can go and take any vegetables from anyone's garden to really explicitly encourage people to take those greens. Uh, you could be part of a community like at Front Yard where they say, hey, these greens have to be picked, otherwise they're going to go to seed, so please come and get the greens. And if they all go to seed, then everyone feels a bit bad. Um, you could actually subsidize people to go and collect these greens. So that's um, a subsidy rather than a tax or um, paying people to take it rather than a price. Uh, and in, with architecture, we have things like this raised garden bread makes um, raised garden bed makes a little bit more accessible to people. We could have um, ramps to include more people who um, who might have different access um, or ways to access the, the space. Um, and when we're online, architecture becomes code, and it becomes particularly powerful. So in real space, it can cost a lot of money and time to build a fence and effort and expertise. Um, online, it takes a lot of expertise as well, but we don't have quite the same barriers. Change can be really, really cheap and really quick and really powerful. You know, we, we don't have things like gravity that are kind of um, architectures that we can't change. We can change everything. And it's really interesting for us thinking about the architecture of democracy and how people access their democracy. But we're not, uh, the Open Australia Foundation is not the government. We have no association with the government. And yet we are attempting to change the architectures of how we um, can enact democracy in our society. Sorry. We're going to try something? Should I keep going? Should I? Keep going. OK. Um, OK. I think you're about to see my. Horrifyingly messy desktop. Oh no? Good. Yay. Um, today we want to talk about access to information. I think that's a really important part of our democracy. You know, everyone here knows how important it is to be able to study um, source code, inspect it. Well, access to information is like that, but for our society and our government, <laughs> governmental institutions and democracy. Um, really explicitly, uh, in terms of our democratic institutions, we need to be able to hold M uh, the people we've elected, local councillors, MPs, accountable. And we need information about the things they're doing uh, and ways that we can hold them accountable to, to do that. Um, we need to, if, to be able to participate in any kind of decision making, you need information, you need to know what's going on. And we need to be able to verify I think that human rights are being applied to everyone, that the law is being applied equally. And access to information is all about those parts of our democracy. But it's not, it's not kind of so political all the time. So when I first got into freedom of information and getting access to government documents, it was about um, human rights abuse. But more recently, and I feel like sometimes some of the more powerful ways that we can access information is when it's actually quite banal. So this uh, on the right here is a, uh, was a, um, is a road near where I live. And on the right is this bike path that was built quite recently. But there was construction going there for ages. And now you're kind of in your area, and there's just all this road construction. You have no idea what it's about. So when that happened to me, I've started cycling recently. So I was kind of quite interested in this. And I thought this cycle lane kind of went nowhere. So I put in a request for all the information that the council had about the purpose of this cycle lane and where it went. And they came back to me with this extensive documentation about all their plans for cycle lanes in my area, and maps, and how much they're each going to cost, and what the, you know, what the other council next door thinks, and all this really interesting information that got me really excited, and gives me more ways to kind of give them feedback now. Like, the end of this cycle lane has a really crap uh, off-ramp that you know, can damage your wheels and stuff like that. So now I'm giving them feedback about that. So with this information, I can participate. Um, and it, it is something quite banal we can all get involved with. So imagine where someone trying to access information from a government institution. Uh, many people here are, are that person. And um, how, how is our action regulated? What are the different things that might help or hinder us in getting that information? And let's look at rules first. 
the people kind of, you know, we are our government, we have set up our, our legislation and rules, and we decided that it would be really good for us to actually have some explicit rights about accessing government information because it is useful in all those ways we looked at before. And so we set up freedom of information rights in Australia. We were one of the earliest countries too. I think we were almost uh, 200 years after Sweden, but still one of the earliest countries. Um, and that's called the Freedom of Information Act federally, but then there are different acts in different states. So I think it's called Rights for Information in Tasmania. It's um, Government Access Public Information, I think. Government Information Public Access Act in New South Wales. Um, but basically these things say, you have a right, and that's all of us here have a right to ask our government for any document, and they have to give it to us in 30 days, basically, unless it meets some specific exemptions. And mostly that means that bits of the document will be exempted, but you will actually get the document. It's extremely powerful. It's basically how you know, most really major excellent news stories are getting broken in Australia. To, through FOI and getting that kind of information. So it's this really, really powerful tool. And that's actually on our side. So it's pretty exciting. Um, but how does it actually work? How do you actually do FOI? And what's that actual space like to kind of experience doing it? And it, it, it's kind of, it has a very bad reputation. But basically, you would try and find your local council website, for example, in, in, in my case. And you'd kind of scroll around on their crap website and find a little like GIPA or some acronym that you don't understand. And you would somehow know that that was about accessing information. And you'd click on there. And somewhere on that page would be an email address. And you'd read all this stuff. And it may or may not be helpful or written in a, in a way that you can understand or the language that you understand. And then you'll send them an, info, uh, an email. And it's quite an intimidating process. Um, it all happens behind closed doors, basically, uh, which is, is a real problem. There's not great data on, on FOI in Australia for that reason. Um, and it's quite difficult and intimidating. So this is, um, so that kind of is the email we're looking at there. So this is the hack that one of our, this is the bug that one of our projects tries to fix, the difficulty of freedom of information requests and accessing government documents. Uh, I need to actually remember to stop saying freedom of information requests and say accessing information, because remember that is the thing that we're trying to do, and freedom of information is just a kind of hack by the government or by that we have set up to try and help us get information, but it is not the end game. So right to know is here to help. This is the website. It's all about making it easy to get documents and information from the government. Um, we can hit make a request, and then we just type in, rather than having to go and find their email and who they are and all that stuff, we just kind of start typing in the agency we're interested in. Uh, it brings up a list. We can go make a request. It says, are you making a personal request or a private or a public request? What type of information are you, are you after? And it helps you out a little bit there. Uh, if we are after public information, it's just this little form here now. So it's just a subject and this body, and it tries to make it as easy as possible and do heaps of the legalese and stuff like that for you, so making this process much better. Uh, and you start typing, and you say, oh, I'm after the software that Centrelink are using for their data matching um, process at the moment. And so I, I start typing that in, and it goes, oh, there's already someone else has made this request. So that's helping people in a really big way because it removes duplication of FOI requests. Um, if you don't have to make a request, that's a million times better than making one. So we're really trying to help there. But uh, I'd go ahead and I'd write out my request. And it's that simple. I'd say, hello, um, you run this project. I want these bits of information about it, or any documents that include them. Uh, if you need any information about what source code is, which you probably do, that's all good. Thank you. Um, and yeah, all good. And it's public on the internet. And that's a really, really important thing so that others can follow this and see what's happening. Um, this is an example of another one. Um, people here are probably interested in data retention. So someone put in a request for how many agencies under the Act were trying to be, um, become enforcement agencies so they can get warrantless access to all our telecommunications data. Uh, that was successful, and we can all see now this list of 61 agencies, I think, who want to become enforcement agencies. And that's all public on Right to Know. Uh, even better, and this is my, my favorite feature about Right to Know, is we can aid each other in making FOI requests and use our information about systems and documents and laws to do that. So this is 
uh, superstar Lokita Sam, who has made incredible contribution to um, democracy in Australia. Um, Lokita just goes around and leaves incredible legal kind of advice in fairly humorous form for people that they then follow and make much more effective requests and is yeah, amazing. And a big shout out to Ben Fairless as well, who's another one of our amazing contributors. Um, you can also search for requests. Um, so if you want to know about how much the government's paying to get extended um, support on Windows XP, you can find out. <laughs> so that's right to know. So right to know is trying to make things a little bit better. But, and I think this really speaks to the future of this project, norms. Uh, norms are this other really important force, and I think some ways in this framework, the most important force. Um, there's a culture inside government that Pierre War spoke about on Tuesday, I think it was. Um, that this is a quote from 2015 from the head public servant in Australia saying that FOI laws are very pernicious, which um, I had no idea what pernicious meant, but means harmful. Um, and that the rest of this is kind of about good governance by obscurity. Um, who thinks that is a good idea? No one. Um, this is a, a real attitude in government that I actually, you know, there are lots of wonderful public servants, and I'm going to talk about that in a sec, but there is also this attitude of um, trust us, don't worry about it, like this is too complex for you. P and Pia um, quoted uh, somebody on Wednesday, I think it was, saying, um, you know, we'll tell the citizens about it if we feel like it. They should feel honored that, you know, that we would share with them. Like that is a real attitude that some people in government have. Um, and it is a big problem and a big blocker to people getting access to information. I think partly because of that, a lot of us have internalized this thing that it's, this is way too hard to get access to information. Uh, I've, I've um, been in a university setting where a journalism professor just said to 100 students, um, FOI is too hard, it's too expensive, and it's really slow, just don't worry about it. Uh, and so all those students now don't use those rights. Um, I think that's actually part of, of that response leads to the culture a lot of us see where if you're someone interested in systems or politics, other people will kind of think that you're a meddler or, or like um, kind of have a go at you. I think that they've internalized the, um, just the distress of this situation where the government, lots of people in government, unfortunately, uh, really try and lock us out. So this is the kind of trust us and it's too hard, internal and external cultures. But FOI isn't actually hard, slow, and expensive. It's actually often free, fast, and really easy. Um, and when people have this experience of making a request with some real information they need and it goes really well, those ideas change and they start telling other people and that's really exciting. Uh, so I think a really important part of the future of these projects is we need lots more people using them and making requests if we're really going to change those cultures in government and in society. And over the next 10 years, we really need to, to up this. So this is, um, if you can read it, this is requests over time since 20, mid-2012. Um, and it is really increasing really rapidly, which is fantastic and accelerating, but we need to do more with that. This, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty proud of this, my really bad statistics of how many of all federal FOI requests go through our site. Uh, and I reckon it's probably at about 10% at this point. It's really hard to know because we don't have those data. But this is an open source project with two full-time staff run out of one of them's former bedroom. There are government agencies with millions of dollars trying to get people to make FOI requests. So I think that is, is a testament to the power of open source software and you know, what we can all do. But you know, we need all these more people doing this and having that experience, but often FOI isn't easy or free or fast. Often it is actually really crappy and slow. And when people have that experience, they get really turned off. So we need to keep making FOI easier. Uh, and this is this thing that you know, people, they, they get that we make things a little bit better, they get through, and there's just more problems. And often that problem can be price. So our FOI laws in different, different states are different. So federal, it's free. But in New South Wales, for example, there's an arbitrary $30 fee to make an FOI request that serves no purpose, thank you, but to, um, 
but to exclude people, in, in my opinion. Uh, it doesn't cover the administrative cost of dealing with these requests at all. Um, and also, you have to, they're asking you to email them a, a doc file or a PDF with your credit card details in it, or fill out a money order. Has anyone ever done a money order? Exactly. Um, so that is really exclusionary as well and a big problem. Um, there are some solutions to this. Um, so sometimes FOIs can be hundreds of dollars if they, they try and charge you. And then we've had really good success with people um, crowdsourcing. Michael actually crowdsourced FOI requests successfully a few years ago. Um, that's really awesome. I don't know if it's a kind of solution that scales or we're going to be able to roll out for smaller amounts and to people who don't have access to kind of social media and stuff like that. So, but it, it is interesting. But I think the root cause and getting around FOI is actually another way. So if, if um, this is in South Australia, they have some of the worst FOI laws in Australia and the oldest ones. And um, Dan is making this request for these um, autopsy reports of these whale beachings. And the people at the South Australian Museum who are awesome, uh, Fran, just like, yeah, I'm just going to waive those fees. No worries. This is awesome. You should have this information. And Fran is like, is a legit public servant helping the public and should be really celebrated. And you know, we really need to reward and get behind people like this because um, they, are set, they, they are the example that we should all be following. Uh, and you can see how happy Dan is um, down there. Um, and that is just one problem, and this, I think, is a really major issue for our site. So whenever we kind of, we, with all of our projects, the planning is a really good example, if you um, overcome something, there is just more problems and things don't work how people expect them to with a complex system like government. Um, and all these forces actually look different depending on who you are. So for me, um, cis white male, university educated middle class, these, um, like $30 for me, isn't a huge deal. But for other people, it's totally exclusionary. And those are really big problems. Uh, and there are heaps of them that I can't even see. Uh, Oren spoke about on Monday. I think this is, I think every talk reference Oren now. Um, but this is, this is just, it was, her talk was just such a fantastic summary of um, contempt culture and this problem. So I really recommend you check it out. But, we really don't know enough. There are all these problems that we can't see that we need to be able to get through to. Um, this is some more uh, data. So this is the most pop this is the most, um, uh, the people who have made the most requests on uh, Right to Know. Does anyone kind of see some, a pattern there? Yeah, they're almost all men. Um, and I don't, yeah. I mean, I don't want to make any assumptions of, of people's identity, but they also have, there's lots of you know, European names there as well. So on a number of lines, this group is representing a group in society that is already you know, extremely powerful compared to marginalized groups. And if, doc if de um, democracy is about decentralizing power, we really need to get past that in order to really be doing our job. Um, I, at the same time, I don't want to act just kind of invisible away all the incredible people who aren't part of those groups in, in, our, um, in our project. So Lockheed Sum, again, uh, is, is a woman um, who lives in the Netherlands and is just like, I cannot express how amazed I am but, uh, of the um, contribution she just makes to democracy for all of us. Go and check out and follow her, her requests. Um, but also Evelyn and Katsumanska, who's one of the founders of the foundation, and Michaela Ash, who's our amazing parliamentary re uh, researcher, and lots of other women involved in our projects um, are doing incredible work. Um, but this is still a really big problem and something we need to address. Um, this, is a, this is an example of not being able to see those problems. So this was me a couple of weeks ago, uh, where Brent, uh, Brent, this is to do with the not my debt, thank you. Um, uh, whole not my debt um, government is trying to put a huge amount of pressure on people who uh, are least able to um, to deal with that. It's really horrifying. Um, but Brett's saying, make an FOI request, and you can get all the data about how they made your debt assessment, and, which is quite useful if you're going to make an appeal. And he's like, and use right to know. And I'm just immediately like, oh, that's an awesome idea. And here's a way you can make it way more efficient. But 
if I had had the experience of making one of those appeals or trying to get that data, I would have immediately said, oh, that shouldn't go through right to know at all because that includes all of your, um, your history of payments from the government or your employment, huge amount of personal data about you. And not only am I like, yes, it is a good idea to put it publicly on the internet, but here's a way to make that even more efficient. Right? Um, I then immediately tried to go out there and correct this, and luckily we had no requests. But I didn't see that issue, and that's very much to do with my context and who I am so, and my perspective. So we really do need to broaden our perspectives. And so I think this is the future of our project. These are the steps that we're going to hit along the way. Um, we need social norms inside and outside government to change, and to do that, we need lots more people using this, these projects. So that's, that's a huge amount of work we need to do. Um, we need more people to have that positive experience. We need it to get easier and easier to access government information through right to know. Um, and we need to be looking at those root solutions, like if you can avoid making the FRI request, do. And we need to solve those problems faster, because we, you know, as we get more people using the projects, we need more of them to be having a positive experience so it can really uh, escalate. And we need a wider range of people accessing the information they need to actually be decentralizing power. Otherwise, we're just reinforcing the patriarchy. Uh, and we need a greater variety of perspectives in our team and amongst our contributors to really achieve that. So very quickly, two minutes. Is that two minutes with questions? OK, okay cool. Um, how can, how can you get involved or do your own projects? Or, you know, I, I don't want to just kind of be like, we have all this work to do, but you can be part of this. So straight up, you could take a photo of this or it's online, I can send it to you. This is just a really simple template for making an FOI request. Um, so you just put in the organization as the information, your local council or whatever. Say, so give me the latest documents with information you want. Uh, if possible, just send it through. Don't make in a whole FOI request and do all the paperwork. Uh, Luke, or whatever. Okay. Heaps of people here know all about systems, know all about administration. A lot of people here know about law. Um, you can actually help people. And on, on Right to Know, you can go and annotate people's requests. If you'd love to talk more about that, um, I can direct you. But you can go and follow requests and follow people and get emails about their requests. So that's a fantastic way to contribute. We make open source software. There's heaps of interesting tech underneath our projects that I would love to talk about, but I kind of was excited about this. But there's right to know. There's all the issues, of course. Um, Oliver Telly is the incredible open source software that right to know is built on top of that runs around the world and is awesome. And we have other crazy projects at Open Australia. We would also love you to join us, to not only become a contributor of our project, but we are, we are trying to expand our team of full-time people and, and get another developer involved. We're particularly looking for people who have a different perspective than, than Hanari and I have at the moment. So if that sounds like you and you're excited about all this stuff, we would love to talk with you. Um, but also, if, if you're uh, in Sydney, we have a regular pub meetup. Um, so we'd love to talk about that. So come and hit me up about that. And I just, if I can just leave you with one last thing, is that to get involved with this stuff and the futures that we can imagine and the small steps we can take towards them, the bar is so low. Like, really, it is so easy to make an improvement on our current situation around an issue like access to information. And we always talk about kind of web scale and helping like, billions of people or whatever. But wouldn't it be amazing if any of us could just help you know, 20 people or 100 people do something in a really practical, concrete way? Um, I think that would be pretty awesome. I like this photo because that's George in the middle there. And he's a little bit like us. It's a bit kind of, he looks a bit confused and scary. Uh, and he's looking at these kind of futures and trying to work it out. But, um, but you know, he's there doing it, taking a stand. And I think we can all do that. So thank you very much. Thank you to Luke.